this year. All right, we are rolling. Okay, so my name is Sunny Ray, and uh, we've got here Ben. Ben, do you want to do a quick uh, intro on yourself, and then maybe I'll, I'll chime in? in terms yeah, of who we yeah. are. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, my name is Ben, uh, and I am the host and creator of the BTC Sessions on YouTube, talking all about Bitcoin. Cool. And when did you guys get started? Just curious. Like, how long have you guys? Because I know you've been, yeah, seen your content so, for some time. Uh, I started the YouTube channel in 2016, and then I was kind of into Bitcoin before that since around 2014. Got it. Got it. Cool. And, and uh, my name is Sunny, Sunny Ray, and I am essentially a Bitcoin entrepreneur and have been since uh, since 2012-ish. And uh, yeah, and so I've been a part of a bunch of different projects, but that's that's kind of my intro, if you will. So uh, well, maybe let's just kind of level set here and let everyone know that even though uh, we've probably been aware, I've been aware of you for quite some time, this is our first time, you know, officially connecting, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We had like a quick one minute preamble of, hey, nice to meet you. And and we're just jumping in. We're off the cuff, man. That's off the, the cuff. Do. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of feeling this. So so why don't why don't you go first in terms of, you know, even for our audience, for just each other, in terms of uh, what I would love to know is, you know, a bit more about your story and kind of like, you know, where, 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 where in the world are you, for example, you know, where, where are you coming from? Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm in Canada. I'm in Calgary. Uh, those unfamiliar, if you're in the U.S., I'm just like a few hours north of Montana, uh, kind of near the Rocky Mountains. Um, uh, so I I kind of dove into the Bitcoin space 2014. Just random curiosity i noticed it a few times in 2013 obviously when the, the price is going wild it, it draws a few eyeballs but i kind of you know dismissed it a few times or said oh I'll look at it later and after watching it go from like double digits to over 1200 bucks over the course of a year in 2013 i was like okay it's either a massive scam or there's something there so maybe i'll start reading so i spent a few months kind of uh, reading up as much as I could. And I figured it was worth my time to dive into even more. And I started dabbling here and there. Funny enough, the first time I ever bought Bitcoin at like 50 bucks worth uh, was just, I think within a couple days of uh, the Mt. Gox hack, which for those watching that have no idea what that was, <laughs> it was the largest Bitcoin exchange on the planet at the time, uh, which held like a vast majority of the percentage of traded Bitcoin. And if essentially it went down and they were like insolvent and all the Bitcoin was missing. And it is, wow, and wow, wow. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the way that the media played it was um, that Bitcoin had been hacked Luckily mm. enough, I had done enough reading that I understood that wasn't the case, that Bitcoin itself was in no way broken. It was just a terrible business that that was not very security conscious. And so I, I kept going. I kept learning. Um, and then after a couple of years trying to dive through a lot of material, I realized that it was it was difficult to parse through a lot of Bitcoin material, especially back then. There wasn't a lot of easy to digest stuff. Um, and I was pretty comfortable in front of a, a camera and per, I, I had a background in performing and uh, singing and dance and all this kind of stuff. And I was used to being on camera and I was fine with that. So um, I also used to teach uh, school age children how to break dance. So, <laughs> um, so I had, uh, you know, my fingers in like the, the methodology of breaking down complex topics for school age children. And, uh, and that's surprisingly similar to breaking down complex technology for adults. So <laughs> I put two and two together, started making videos in around 2016 and have been doing so ever since. I think now, as of now, the channel has about 3.3 million views, which is wild. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's, and, and then the channel. So what, what is it exactly just for, for at least yeah. listeners? So, so BTC sessions, the idea initially was just um, whatever I felt like covering in a tutorial kind of outline or, or, or framework um, to get people to learn the basics of how to purchase, hold, secure uh, Bitcoin and how to avoid scams. 
And since then I've started doing more content and I'm kind of going through my programming to, to fine tune everything. But essentially right now I'm doing news. I'm still doing tutorials on relevant things and updating old ones and uh, interviews. So that's kind of my focus. Awesome. Awesome. So that is super interesting. And, and you're, and you just say you're from Alberta as well. Like you were born and yep. raised in Calgary well, or, or near <laughs> around there. Or? Uh, I was born in Ontario. Ontario. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was born in uh, a little town in Ontario, moved out to Calgary when I was like six. So I've basically been here my whole life. Um, other than a few years when I was younger, done a lot of traveling though. So interesting. I, I you, like you, and, you and I have reciprocal lives because I actually <laughs> was born and raised in Alberta and uh, live in Ontario and live in Toronto for go. the last 20 years so uh, that's yeah. crazy <laughs> De definitely it's funny my sister uh, moved out to Toronto for a while um, she's actually in LA now but um, she did the again the the moving from Ontario to Alberta then back to Ontario for a little bit yeah, yeah. Actually, my my family and my parents still live in Edmonton, and they they're ah. actually just visiting me now as we speak. So, um, so, so we've got yeah. rival hockey teams. Rival hockey teams. Yeah. And so <laughs> that that's fascinating. And so I, I wonder. So you, you you guys, so you or your team or yourself, you focus mostly on on calling out scams as well. So what what are some of the more popular ones you guys have called out in the past that uh, uh, you know? Well, so it's it's difficult because there's there's kind of like a spectrum of of what i consider to be scammy versus just maybe not worth people's time um and so there's there's the outright scams there's the scams that oh yeah uh, send your bitcoin here and we'll double it every you know x amount of time and and stuff like that obviously it's just outright ponzi schemes um, they're banking on the fact that people don't know what Bitcoin is and that when you send it to them, you won't realize that it's irreversible and there's no protections there. Um, it's cash basically for the internet. And if you hand a wad of cash to a stranger on the street, it's a good chance you're never going to see that cash again. Mm. So people need to be in that mindset. Um, then there's the, the similar types of scams that prey on people's uh, fear um, a lot of time in Canada and, and I guess around the world, but you'll see like tax scams where you'll get a shady phone call saying, Hey, we've got police en route to your location. You haven't paid your taxes. The only way for you to deal with this right now is head to this machine. You have to scan this barcode and put in cash. And what they're trying to do is get you to uh, use a Bitcoin ATM, which allows you to convert cash to Bitcoin and send it to them. At that point, it's irretrievable. It's, it's almost akin to going to, um, going to like a precious metals dealer, buying a, a, a lump of gold and then giving it to a stranger. You can't then go back to the precious metals dealer and say, you need to refund me because they've given you an actual good and you've been irresponsible with that good. Same thing as with, with a, uh, a Bitcoin ATM, the Bitcoin ATM operators are actually giving you it, even though it's intangible, they're giving you a good and you're giving that to another individual. And they're at that point, they're kind of not responsible. It's out of their hands. Um, so that's tough. And then on the spectrum of scammy stuff, there's there, you know, there was the ICO craze, which anybody in familiar stands for initial coin offering where, companies thought just because it's digital and it's cryptocurrency that they could create a token, which is a, essentially a, an unregistered security um, with no protections or promises for the people buying it um, and then sell those and give people undue expectations that the token will track the value of the company, which it wouldn't. Uh, it was just like a useless token <laughs> pretty much every time. Um, and we're seeing a lot of the same stuff in uh, currently, and I believe this will be the next phase of people getting destroyed is, is kind of the DeFi space, decentralized finance, where you're seeing similar things. People will take a token and, and they'll create tokens and they'll say, hey, deposit your Bitcoin and Ethereum here. And they're doing like a decentralized exchange. And in order for you to uh, deposit and like provide liquidity to their decentralized exchange, they'll 
pay you out with these tokens and they become these massive pump and dumps that go up a hundred, you know, hundreds of percent in a day and then drop off in the same day. There's many tokens that have had this, the all time high and the all time low in a 24 hour period. So it's just, it, it gets ridiculous. Um, but that's, that's part of the space. Um, people can build whatever they want. Yes, there can be some legal repercussions later, but those often come years after the fact. The ICO craze was in 2017, and we're still seeing judgments being rolled, handed down today, even in the past few weeks on a lot of these ICOs, like three years later. I think the DeFi space is going to see a lot of the same um, because it's, it, it is centralized in a lot of instances. Like there's there's kill switches on these things where they can freeze the protocol or like make tokens no longer uh, uh, usable. And so it's, it's centralized. And if there's a centralized point of failure, an individual that you can point to regulators can go after them. So there's, it's, it's definitely a spectrum of, Hey, I'm just going to outright steal your money all the way up to, I think I'm doing something useful, but I don't understand that it I'm not. And, there's no value here. Wow, that is, yeah, well said. Um, <laughs> but but if we have to dig a bit deeper, like how, because you said there's a spectrum, right? So there's like the Rujas, we got mm -hmm. Ruja, right? Yeah. She's, she's, I don't know, have they caught her yet? Who knows? No, but she, but one there's point like these, is still like, missing. <laughs> you know, there's like these, but, but people, I mean, do fall for them, but it's obviously very clearly illegal to do, mm -hmm. you know, what they did. Um, and to many of us, it was apparent, right? And then it just needed to play out. But then there are, and then there's like Bitcoin, I consider as like kind of a beacon of light, right? It's kind of like, it's, yeah. it you know, did, didn't raise money from the public to start with. It was just kind of, you know, it just it emerged and, mm -hmm. and uh, it has this like decentralized community and, and really the, like the thought process behind it and everything was just targeted at becoming this one thing. And then, which I really saw as like a unit step function increase in terms of like level of innovation from everything that came before it. Mm -hmm. And then everything that came after it, and I'll, I'll just, you know, call out Litecoin as like one, you know, of these, where you, as somebody who kind of can look at the code and, and what's happening, you're like, wait, he changed three parameters. Three parameters in this. That's not a unit step function increase in innovation. And that's just like me going, I get how this thing works. Like, I'll call it the silver to Bitcoin's golder. And it's a narrative that still plays. And okay, it's a free market, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But my point is, is like, at what point is it, you know, no longer innovation and, you know, straight up like slimy? Like, how do you, like someone needs to chart this out on one of those like quadrant graphs or whatever, but like, uh, but how, how, like, cause it's, it's always interesting to me to like help, you know, people navigate that and make their, you know, decisions as well as somebody who's run a brokerage for, for such a long time. Um, but yeah, yeah, but how do you think through that? Like, what are the, I guess, what are the two, axes that you would put um if you had to make that quadrant that you base it on yeah it's i mean it's very difficult to 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 suppose somebody's intent right hmm. um it's it's so that's why i i i try not to specifically say whether or not somebody had ill intent i mean if, if it's obvious if it's like deposit your bitcoin and i'm gonna double it yes you're a scammer but um, when it comes to when it comes to iterative stuff, where people think that they're innovating um, by changing a few little things, and they think that that is going to replace something like Bitcoin, which is like an order of magnitude better than the current system, whereas, like you said, changing three parameters, which ended up not even really doing what they set out to do, because one of those was to make it ASIC resistant, which is uh, so that you wouldn't get, you know, large mining firms. And so, so it was more like one computer, one vote kind of thing that didn't even work. Um, you know, like I, I could see how maybe the intent there, at least off the hop, was not necessarily I'm going to scam people for money. But you also have to consider that there's probably uh, the, that monetary incentive is hanging there that like, Hey, if I create this, this is early enough. Look what happened to Bitcoin. If I can get a good chunk of this and I'm there early in the, the, the creation process, I could have a huge chunk of this monetary base. 
And that wasn't present in Bitcoin. And a lot of people don't understand that, but the incentives in Bitcoin very early on, there, there were none because it was valueless and it had to grow and gain users to attain any value whatsoever. Um, and so I would argue nowadays, it's, it's impossible to fairly launch a new coin um, and not have that, that kind of creation process tainted in one shape, way, shape or form where somebody hones in on some aspect of it and gains undue influence or a huge portion of the pie um, in, in a, uh, I don't know, kind of a malicious manner. I think that's incredibly difficult, if not possible to do. So I, I tend to look at Bitcoin and I tend to tell people, understand Bitcoin as deeply as you can before you start to apply that litmus test to everything else. Um, so I look at Bitcoin and I say, well, why, why was I interested? Why, why am I here? What was the purpose of Bitcoin? And so first off, I, I like, I take, um, I take like quick free transactions more or less off the table. That wasn't the main issue that was trying to be solved. Um, you know, for there's, there's the unbanked portion of it. Yes, I understand that. But um, by and large, like this was created by, it, it was created in response to the irresponsibility of central banking and the lack of checks that came along with that um, and what it enabled, which, you know, it was on the heels of the 2008 financial crisis and you had all of these players, these high up players that were quote unquote, too big to fail, that made a lot of terrible decisions, ruined a lot of people's lives. And the central banks were able to say, yeah, but you get a free pass. And they were able to create more currency, pump it back into those entities, and they got off scot-free. And so it kind of, it, it got rid of the, it got rid of the consequence of, of bad decisions. And so there's a subset of people in our economy nowadays that essentially have no consequence to bad behavior. And that spurs more bad behavior. And so Bitcoin was a response to that in that you can have a monetary base that can't be, you, you can't pervert price signals. It's kind of like the most true price signaling mechanism that we know if it continues to proliferate and grow. Um, and how does how is that enabled? Well, uh, one, it's it has a cap supply. So you know the monetary supply. There's no like, it, eventually there will be no more um, and there's no way to kind of pervert that. Um, two, you can verify yourself very easily by running a node if you choose to. Um, and that's a big one because if you cannot do that, it gets to the point where only, oh, if, if it gets too expensive or prohibitive to be able to run that software yourself, um, then it gets to the point where centralized entities are the only one that do that. And that was kind of the issue with, with the gold standard is who could audit it? Who could verify the consensus rules of the gold standard and ensure that it was backed, you know, $35 to an ounce of gold? Um, well, it was the central banks and the, the banking system itself. And that involved trust and with monetary incentives that the gold standard gradually uh, kind of, there was already inflation before Nixon went off the gold standard, but effectively you were having to trust other people to keep everything above water. And that's never gonna happen if, with those monetary incentives. So if you can't run a node, if you can't self-verify everything yourself, um, then it starts to degrade and get away from um, the very reasoning that, that it was put together. And so I, I look at a lot of these projects that have, if, if they enjoy any sort of success, it becomes incredibly difficult to run a node. Ethereum is a perfect example um, when it comes to being sure of the monetary base. Um, 
it, right now, like originally there was a promise of around a hundred million units. They said, well, it'll probably end here. Well past that, past like 110 million units at this point. Um, furthermore, the, the protocol is able to be forked or, or non backwards compatibly changed pretty much on a whim. Um, last December, they did a hard fork uh, to change something in the protocol. They forgot to add something and then they did another hard fork a week later. And when it, you're just talking about regular software, it's not a big deal to push an update because you forgot to do something. But when you're talking about a network that depends on consensus, if you're able to easily push out non-backwards compatible changes to the protocol, that beckons to the fact that it is centralized because you can't get everybody to upgrade that quickly unless nobody is running the software itself, unless there's so few people running it. Like if, if Bitcoin tried to roll out a hard fork in a week, you would have that network just fork apart immediately because you, you cannot get everybody on board to do that. Um, and, I, and as a lot of people are in the mindset of Silicon Valley and software, thinking that quick upgrades are good. But when you're trying to replace a monetary base and establish a set of rules that everybody agrees on, if you're quickly changing those rules constantly, you will, it, it gets away from the fact that you're establishing an actual new monetary base that everybody agrees upon. It, it, it's the antithesis of what's trying to be achieved. Wow, uh, that was uh, that was awesome. And in terms, and the reason I say that was because. Uh, yeah, like I said, I moved out to Toronto almost 20 years ago, and I actually got to see uh, the Ethereum project kind of in its early days. And uh, to this day, I kick myself for not, you know, obviously partaking in 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 that uh, ICO. I guess they didn't do an ICO, but whatever they called it. Was, it. it was basically um, an ICO. I, I, would, I would venture to say it was the world's first ICO. I still don't get, yeah, how, I still don't get, yeah, like how it's not in the sense that they did raise, but anyways, the CFTC chairman dude said he loved it today. I, I, there is that. I, I, I guess. <laughs> anyways, um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, guess, I guess if that could be used as a, as a positive, <laughs> the regulators <laughs> love it. <laughs> Um, I, I know, I feel like I'm living in a bit of a quagmire, like, a, you know, Twilight Zone type of thing, because I, yeah, sometimes the world doesn't always make sense. Um, but I was going to say is that, um, yeah, since you brought it up, you know, with this whole Ethereum thing, right? So there were, I guess there's that, the ICO, whatever, whether it was or not. But you know, there was this piece around Turing completeness, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, if, if one is to kind of argue whether Ethereum is or is not truly innovative or innovative, it, you'd have to question whether that initial, because I mean, from my understanding that, I mean, whether you call it a world computer or blah, 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 whatever, what, from what I, from a technical perspective, from what I recall, you know, is that they were trying to build, um, a bit of a Swiss army knife of blockchains. They, he got tired of all these other like protocols that were trying to use Bitcoin. It just didn't feel right. So his whole aha moment was like, let's build a, um, a programmatic kind of layer where you can use like if, while, like you can use loops mm. and you know, you can just like, you can use programming, yeah. right? Essentially, whereas like, so Bitcoin is more like a calculator. His kind of insight was let's build a blockchain that is not just a calculator, but that can do programs. Um, but now, okay, let's put the fact that they raise money. I think that is obviously according to like the regulations seems like a bit of a no, no, but maybe because it's ubiquitous enough, it, it, enough it, in, in enough people's hands that they didn't get to it fast. Yeah, enough, so they're like, I, hey, I, I think it's a timing it, but, thing. Right, right, which is which just sends a super weird message, you know what I mean? Like, so now if someone does it, then why is it wrong? But then it's not, um, it's just should be consistent at least to some extent. So, all this regulatory action is a bit confusing. Um, but we, you know, Uno Coin, the company I founded, uh, and by the way, I didn't really share a bit, but maybe on in terms of my background, I, I, uh, uh, like I said, I'm from Edmonton, I was born and raised in Edmonton, and I studied electrical engineering at the University of Alberta. Mm -hmm. I transferred over to U of T, did the last couple of years here and then I lived in Toronto for the last 20 years and I actually um, back in 2012 I was uh, so I, I'd spent first of all I, after engineering I spent a couple of years as a financial 
uh, advisor, air quotes, <laughs> had all my licenses, you know, ran a brokerage and really at the end of it felt more confused about money than I did at the beginning of that journey. I was just like, I don't get it. Like these people are like, they wear nice suits and yeah. use big numbers. And it's like, but they, it doesn't make sense. And I kind of left that space, spent eight years in robotics, um, working for a Canadian robotics company, and then moved out to uh, India in 2011, 2012, uh, was bit by the Bitcoin bug, uh, read the white paper, became super obsessed. Long story short, started India's first Bitcoin platform. So it's like the coin base of India, very similar mm -hmm. investor base, such as Barry Silbert. Uh, more recently, Tim Draper invested as well. A million and a half users. Um, and I guess the highlight, you know, there is then some people may or may not know, but uh, about two years ago, the central bank, the Reserve Bank of India issued a notice saying that uh, Bitcoin companies weren't allowed to have banking services. It was our company, along with uh, several others in the community that challenged that notice um, at the Supreme Court. It was a long two year drawn out battle um, in which at the end, uh, all three judges sided with us and and we now have banking again and uh, awesome. like i said we just raised a, a, a round of financing from tim draper and a bunch of other really cool investors um and uh yeah so i've i've i've, I've had a chance to um you know and I'm, and I'm also involved with a couple of projects in canada namely Paycase. uh mm -hmm. that also has a bit of a colored back uh background but um but I, i've seen you know i've seen a lot i've, I've heard a lot and I just find it like really hard to just figure out in my mind, even like forget regulators for a second, right? Like there's gotta be some other axioms for like when you're screwing somebody versus when you're not. And, and if it's based on like the intentions of the person, I mean, they can always say one thing and claim another, right? I guess motives are important, but it's like, it'd be nice if there was, you know, if life was just simpler, right? Um, yeah. Because look, Uno Coin, like I was saying, is, is it, our, the name coin was built into our company from 2012. Um, but we never did an ICO because of my financial background. I always knew that like a big no-no is taking money from your neighbor uh, or from anyone off the street to, to, to run a speculative business. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of, mm. you can go to your friends and family or whatever because they know you and maybe they have a lot of information and they can make a, a calculated bet. But to go to just like the world at large for your speculative investment, to me always seemed like a no-no. Um, and so that seemed like a, a nice line to draw in the sand. Okay, don't take money from just a random person. That's one. Um, but beyond that, what else might there be? I mean, uh, like you, you mentioned DeFi, right? And you kind of threw it into this ICO um, camp, which, which I agree to, you know, a large extent. But could it be argued that, you know, innovative things are happening now? I mean, like they are doing lending-ish on the blockchain. They are doing DEXs, you know, on the blockchain. I mean, how are these not exciting ideas? Like, so I guess what I'm saying is I, I've been like, shitting on the ethereum camp for a long time i'm like their number one naysayer but i gotta also kind of be up front when i'm confused a bit right because like they yeah. are they not bringing innovation to this space yes there are a lot of scammers so where, where do you what do you say to that <laughs> so i mean there's there's two ways to look at it um yes you can build interesting things anywhere right you you can build interesting things atop any platform um my issue well uh, apart from like yeah the the ones that pump and dump in a single day because it's clearly just like flavor of the week whatever food token you've issued <laughs> you know yam or sushi or whatever um outside of that my main issue is that it's it's like building it's like building skyscrapers atop shaky foundations you're building you're building these massive structures with tons of capital in them on top of like a swamp and and so it's just that the ground can shift beneath everybody's feet at any point and so my my issue is not with um what's what people are trying to build necessarily like it, it would have to be a case-by-case -case basis in that instance um but more so that the the foundation on which it's built is is ever changing and doesn't doesn't establish 
a base set of rules um, that can be looked upon as solid from which to build on top of. And so when I look at Ethereum that is, is regularly hard forking that effectively with ETH 2.0, they're saying that, and like in interviews you've seen, um, they're, oh yeah, this was never gonna scale, obviously. So we we're obviously gonna change, like as if it was like a given from the, which it wasn't like in two, whatever, 2014, um, as they were raising money, that it wasn't a given that that iteration of it was never going to scale. It was, this is the world computer and it's launching now, put your money in so that you can be a part of this. Um, and so with complexity comes more attack vectors. Um, and so, and, and with constant changing uh, consensus rules, you can never really be sure of what you're building. And so I think like in the Bitcoin space, there's a lot of people that have gotten onto this idea of time preference um, of, okay, what am I going to, is it worth spending my time doing X if the outcome eventually is Y or do I try to get Y now um, even though if it, it means that I'm just going to come at the cost. So like, you know, do I, do I eat uh, a ton of cheeseburgers because they're delicious or do I maybe hold off on that, eat a little bit more healthy, have the odd treat here and there so that I live a healthy lifestyle. And so with that mindset, I think that Ethereum was born of Vitalik's frustration that the base layer of Bitcoin was not iterating fast enough. He wanted to do other things. Sure, that's fine to experiment and build things, but to then say that, okay, that we're gonna build a monetary base here uh, and then build all of these projects on top of it and, and just go with it instead of allowing Bitcoin's base layer to be built out. I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards the idea that Bitcoin is taking that slow, um, low time preference approach, which those unfamiliar with time preference, low time preference means you're not worried about doing things quickly. You're worried about doing things correctly. And so Bitcoin has very much taken that approach of, hey, we're going to take our time. We're going to make sure this thing is bulletproof before we build all this crazy stuff on top of it. Um, you know, you didn't see layer two scaling solutions until two years ago. And there's still, it's still slow. Lightning, you know, is growing quicker now, but it's not like breakneck speed. And that's fine. It doesn't need to be. There's no demand for that right now. Um, but when you get into a situation where you have a base layer that incorporated all these complexities, it's very much contributed to the problems that require ETH2, right? Because it, it, I don't know if you were following, a, a was it last month, when there was that kind of drama back and forth on Twitter where um, Pierre Richard couldn't get anybody to verify the supply of Ethereum for him, and, like themselves. Yeah, of course I followed it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. And, I actually, and, uh, I don't know if, uh, if I, I don't think I mentioned this, but when I was mentioning, you know, how India, we kind of faced a bit of a, a situation, if you will, with the central banks for two years, um, the company was running on fumes. We had to lay off nearly a hundred people about a year and a half ago. It was really sad. And so, uh, so the founder of uh, Kraken, Jesse hired me as their head of global business development. And so I was actually working with uh, Pierre. I, I love the guy. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've definitely been following that. You know, uh, more recently, Samson Mao did an interview with Vitalik. And I, I tweeted, yes. I would say how that was like, so on point. And, um, and I actually wrote a little blog about it on my personal blog that nobody actually reads. Um, but, uh, but Vitalik's dad did, tw did tweet at me because I, because I've met him right there. Well, yeah. so he tweeted um, at it saying, uh, cause I just, I just said, like, this was like the best interview ever. Like people should watch it. Right. That's all I said. I didn't say good or bad. I just thought, I just love like when people are battling ideas essentially. Right. Um, and I'm not an advocate for like, 
you know, like the gun in the room or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm. Like I, I do, I do believe people should be able to like explore ideas freely and whatnot and, and people should take responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but it was really interesting. One thing, and it ties into what you just said. One thing that Vitalik said that really stood out for me in that interview was this notion that, that, it, it, that, that it doesn't, the project doesn't stand for something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wrote about that and, and uh, replied back to his dad saying that, like, I see that as like, I, I think it's intellectually honest for, for Vitalik to say that, that that's one of the areas that the project needs to beef up on. But, but that speaks to what you were saying is, is that if you don't stand for something, like in Bitcoin, it's very clear the problem. Like, I mean, you know, that, that whatever the chancellor, like the whole article thing that was, you know, embedded in the Genesis block is like this is where we're going, right? And yeah. it's like, you know, uh, say anything against it at your own peril. And whereas Ethereum um, really felt like, yeah, it's like, ah, it's not moving fast enough. Oh, I can't do enough on it yet. And so therefore, uh, you know, let's do it our own way. And this monetary base thing, this deflationary nature thing, we will make it disinflationary, I think is the actual technical term that they use. And so they weren't even, I wouldn't even say they necessarily lied, you know, and, and if you read the Ethereum fine print back in the day, they did have all the disclaimers to make sure the lawyers didn't come after them. Like, this is totally at your own risk. There's a good chance nothing can ever come of it. So, you know, I think there's stuff that's to be learned there, but I, I do think a lot about, you know, about this. And I do think that is, and this is what Vitalik's dad said, is, is that, you know, that's potentially both Ethereum's biggest you know, opportunity and maybe its biggest threat. Uh, I would maybe put more emphasis on the latter. Um, and, you know, and then and, and so, so the disinflationary thing, that was one of the main reasons I personally didn't get so excited about it. So I agree with you there. Um, I also had concerns around one thing, which is that I'm not like a UFC fighter, but I like, you know, back in Edmonton, my parents put me in Taekwondo. So I can throw a couple of kicks, you know, I can do the spinning back. And yeah. the fact that I felt like, and I'm not saying this is like a physical threat, but just the fact that I knew who Vitalik was and mm -hmm. that I could maybe do something to him. I would never hurt a fly, by the way, okay? Uh, Non-violence here, <laughs> Gandhi here. But, but I'm just talking about like the fact that I could and that others could always scared me, right? To a large yeah. extent. The fact that Satoshi had the kahunas to just be like, yo, this is it, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, to me was... Oh, I was like, this isn't going to be recreated again. Like this yeah. is magical. Like we've got to put some hours into this. Anyway, I'm kind of going on, but you know what I mean? These were yeah. all things that, you know, I think both of us maybe connected on and made us yeah. like really gravitate towards Bitcoin um, and maybe, you know, think less yeah. about. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, and so like, before I kind of dive into that, I, I do want to kind of it, um, reiterate, or I guess iterate for the first time, um, Everything that I'm saying is not meant to be prescriptive. I'm not saying, I'm not, I don't want to impose those viewpoints and actions on other people. I'm describing my own beliefs of what I think is important. I'm, I'm very anti-regulation, uh, despite my dismay at like the ICO craze and uh, a lot of the garbage that's happening in DeFi with the, like the pump and dumps and stuff like that. I think that stuff should still be able to exist. Uh, if you want to build a pump and dump and you're, you're doing uh, dumb things with people's money, the, the problem nowadays is everybody is so used to being babysat by the legacy system that they don't think where they put their money in the first place in a world where you can build effectively anything. Um, eventually what happens is one, people are, are more thoughtful where they place their money and their value. Um, and two, we start to put in, uh, put together structures that actually can hold people accountable in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, you're not dumping, <laughs> you're not dumping a bunch of Bitcoin on a mystery website with a QR code thinking that it's going to just pan out. Um, and to your point about, uh, founders and like oh Vitalik is there and that's like a, in some way shape or form a security threat I I agree and even beyond that as a security threat of if something happened to him it's also a security threat in that he exists and can and can even talk about his views anymore like Satoshi being gone 
has completely taken Bitcoin so that it has no rulers anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. So people are like, it's a free for all. And you get on Bitcoin Twitter and it doesn't matter if you're both into only Bitcoin. If you say something that the other person doesn't like, they just rake you over the coals. And while that's a difficult environment to try and function in, it's also beautiful in its own way because it holds people to account and there's this constant butting heads of ideas. And when it comes to any project that has a discernible leader, a lot of times those people are held up almost like deities. And so when they say jump, everybody that's holding a bag full of whatever coin that is, they say how high, right? So it's, it's, it's a point of failure in that that person could be uh, negatively compromised and, and hurt. And so that then hurts the credibility of the project, but it also hurts the credibility of the project because who knows if that person's going to make bad decisions in the future. It's no longer a function of, of uh, I, I guess, a, it's, it's no longer a meritocracy. It's a, it's, it's like a, I don't want to say dictatorship, but uh, there's, there's definitely royalty there that has a, a large say. Yeah, I totally agree. Hey, just give me one second here. Sorry, man. Yep. Oh, sorry. Here's my mom taking a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> super great. weird. That's great. I love it. Uh, yeah. Anyways, they're they're just like I said, they're here visiting for the <laughs> week. Uh, I gotta I gotta head out west uh, sometimes. Oh, awesome! As well. If you're if you're um, in the yeah. if you're uh, if you depart the city of champions and come to the real city of champions, let me know. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Bird. okay 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 um no very fascinating yeah and exactly i'm with you on that i'm not i'm with you i'm not like advocating for you know necessarily regulators to come in it's just it's more about um it's more about just like intellectual honesty and putting these ideas out there and i think from our perspective just doing whatever we can to like you know educate people about why we feel a certain way about something and you know people make their own decision at the end of the day you know um, okay, so I was going to ask you, so another kind of question I had for you was, and maybe we've already, I think the theme of this whole conversation revolves around this question, but if you had to pick one thing that you believe to be true, it's like Peter Thiel's, you know, famous question. If you, if there's, if you had to list one thing that you believe to be true, that most other, we'll say, let's say Bitcoiners, okay? It's too easy, I think, to say crypto or blockchain for you, right? But let's say amongst Bitcoiners that you believe to be true that, you know, most others within the Bitcoin, let's even go further, maximalist scene that they would disagree with you on. Because that, 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 I think, lends itself to a harder answer. <laughs> so this is, this is interesting. Um, and again, like... So, I, okay, uh, I had a recent chat with uh, the author Knut Svanholm, and he wrote uh, Bitcoin Sovereignty Through Mathematics, and then he wrote another one called Bitcoin Independence Reimagined. And the reason I had him on is because uh, he, he had this tweet where it was like unpopular opinions amongst Bitcoiners, and he listed off like a bunch of controversial things that... Um, from what you would see on Bitcoin Twitter, uh, you would assume is, is very unpopular. Um, and so one of the things was about religion. And uh, I, I will say from what I've seen on Bitcoin Twitter, there's a lot of Bitcoiners that are also actually religious, which I found... Um, it, it was just the opposite of what I expected. Given that the ethos of Bitcoin is don't trust verify, very much so, in that you, know, you should be able to run the code yourself. It should be open source. You should be able to verify the supply at any one time. Um, you shouldn't trust anything other than what you can verify. And you have that in one corner, and then in the other corner you have God exists. And so... That's fine if somebody wants to go down that road, but I just found it odd to have those two kind of like juxtaposed together. Um, and so we got chatting about that. We got chatting about 
um, why that might be. And, you know, Knut is very, very atheist. <laughs> I am not religious uh, whatsoever. I was, I, I guess I went to Catholic school as a kid, but by the time I was like 11 or 12, I was like, no, not for me. Uh, so I kind of got out of that realm. Um, but I think where it comes from a lot is that um, a lot of Bitcoiners in the realm of uh, low time preference, they also like having kind of like certain morals and or, uh, there's a push for that anyways. Um, and that everything done should have like some sort of intent. And there's also a lot of libertarian thinkers in there where it's like uh, a, um, I guess, socially live and let live and uh, moral, yeah, I, I don't know, kind of, kind of like a don't hurt anybody and live your own life kind of thing. Um, I, I think it comes from that and I can recognize how religion especially in the early days, had a function of helping organize society in some way that allowed people to have like a set almost of consensus rules of like, hey, these are these are our commitments of of not hurting other people and, and being generally good people. I personally think that over time, the and this is from a book called The Sovereign Individual, the function of religion was gradually replaced by the nation state in that it, you know, religion helped organize people and build societal structures. But then as science came into play, that became more the function of like the nation state where, okay, we have a government that now, you know, we either somebody just has power or we vote somebody into power and they help organize society. Um, and I think over time, that's being further decentralized into more just kind of like network level consensus algorithms that will more or less dictate the general rules and then people's preferences will then dictate how society functions from there. So um, yeah, I don't know. I, I know that's a roundabout way of answering your question, but uh, for me, my kind of opposing view to a lot of Bitcoiners is, is I'm not religious and I no longer see value in religion. I think that people can build structures that allow our morals and personal preferences to build society from now on. Fascinating. I'm so glad I asked that question. Okay, I, do you mind if I yeah. follow up with a few uh, yeah. rebuttals on that? Uh, one of my favorite, um, uh, Okay, wait, one of my favorite things to say in general is that my parents are Hindu, my wife is Christian, and I'm confused. <laughs> and the reason I like being confused, it's more just yeah. a hedge, okay? I'm so with you on that. I'm with everything you just said. However, I go to church with my wife on Sundays. <laughs> um, I do all that. I'll tell you why, though. It's just for that fraction of a chance that she's right. And I'm at that finish line and the dude's looking back down at me and he's just like, look, look. And I'm like, oh, but I had it all figured out. So just the fact that I can't prove it or disprove it. Um, so it's a bit of a question mark. I don't pay attention to church, but I'm with you, okay? Second thing I'll say is one of my favorite quotes is where the road to religion ends, the road to spirituality begins. Where the road to spirituality ends, the road to reality begins. <laughs> And so for me, the, I'm a big fan of reality and Bitcoin just happens to ground itself in that, you know, like nothing else. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I just, re I guess yesterday or two days ago, I interviewed Max Kaiser. Um, he's one of our investors as well. And I, him and I got into a bit of a, it was such an interesting conversation where he was talking about how he's religious about Bitcoin. <laughs> And I just love yeah. that concept because that's something I can get religious about. And I love thinking that, you know, that Satoshi <laughs> is the one. <laughs> it's, it's funny because there is, again, like it's, you get into like the definition of, of what religion is and, and I, you know, definitions change over time, but is, I mean, if you start going down the road of like a belief structure, um, then yeah, sure. Like, like Bitcoin literally was meant to give us 
a foundation, uh, a, a measurement of what people value and to not be able to distort that measurement. Hmm. Right now, the measurement of value and people's preferences is fully distorted because the measuring stick can be just grows constantly. And so hmm. like, and I'm talking about the monetary base. And so hmm. people base their decisions. Oh, we've got a guest, a special guest. Yeah, a special guest. Hey. Special guest. Every once in a while, I'll have, I'll have my special guest here too. <laughs> right? Yeah. This is Eva. She's giving you a thumbs up. Thumbs up. Hey, Eva. Say hello. Hi, Ben. Hello. hello. <laughs> yeah. This is Eva. Awesome. This is Eva. I'm sure she's got some yeah. hard hitting questions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's coming yeah. in with with heat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah. She just she just turned three. Sorry. Continue. Continue. Oh yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries. Um, so yeah, like I I think that in in having a belief structure, um, I think that Bitcoin is just like could be seen as like setting those ground rules for society. If like, okay, so all all we need to know is is what is our monetary base? How is it issued? Um, how does it work, so on and so forth. Once you have that set, then you actually have a measure of what people want and how and how they're allocating their capital. And that's a, an incredibly valuable thing to understand and see. And we don't see it now because if people make mistakes, then, then it, it's almost rewarded. And new value is not value, but new money is created and funneled into areas that don't necessarily reflect the value of society. And that's been abundantly clear this year in that you see record unemployment and you see the stock market pumping. And, and is that is that the, the way that society actually functions? Not really, like those companies aren't, weren't suddenly building more value for other people. It's that people, at least the people that are getting the new money are understanding that the money is valueless and they need to put it elsewhere in order to preserve their purchasing power. And so you're seeing it funnel into equities, you're seeing it funnel further into real estate, into other things. And it, it the money is no longer a good measuring stick. It's almost like stocks and housing are a measuring stick for value now. Um, and, and that's very difficult to kind of put a number on. And so, um, yeah, I, I do think that that Bitcoin, a, as a as a set of values for society, could be viewed in a way as religion. I I think that when you get into um, how religion is treated nowadays, you can see that in something like Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. And so where you get to the literal, like analyzing the words in the sacred text, that's what that seems like to me. Bitcoin, like the Bitcoin that everybody actually uses, um, that's the, the uh, what's the word I'm, I used it previously? That, that's, the, um, that's the people that are actually looking at the practical knowledge being put forward and trying to interpret it the best they can. When you get to something where somebody's saying, this paper that was written exactly 12 years ago says this word, and I interpret this word as this, and that's it. And if anything different is there, if it hasn't gone that direction, then, then you are, it's sacrilege. Um, yeah, and I think that's a, a garbage way to do it. And you know, we've seen that in the perversion of many different <laughs> approaches on religion in the past so yeah it's 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 a tricky subject no well if you think about it they say you know religion is everywhere and nowhere or whatever god is everywhere and nowhere i mean that's kind of true about bitcoin mm -hmm. yeah yeah well I'm, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, th I think i think broadening out it's that's money right that's money is everywhere. It, it informs every decision that we make. It's incredibly powerful and important and people don't understand it. And it's a crime, not a crime, but it's a shame that more people don't understand the impact money has on our lives and how much it informs our decisions and how we lead our lives. And the perversion of money um, by, by people who have undue influence over it perverts 
our incentive structures and our actions in everyday life. It's, it's insane how much it does. Totally agree. Totally agree. Okay. Bye bye. See you later. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Yeah. She's, um, we are just going to go back to my, um, anything, uh, in terms of, I was going to ask you, so, so we just to, just to kind of sum up that the answer to that question then, um, on your side would be that you think the, the biggest contradict, not contradictory, but the thing that most others would disagree with you on is this, like this kind of like the fact that there's a lot of religious people that are gravitating towards yeah, Bitcoin. I mean, like tra right? traditional religious individuals in Bitcoin in particular. Hmm. And again, like it's fine, I, whatever. I, I hmm. don't really care. I'm, I'm interested in Bitcoin. I just found it odd that there was a, a large number or what seems to be a large number of very religious Bitcoiners. Um, it, it kind of, again, it, it seems a tad antithetical to me but yeah yeah no no i totally agree with it i, I mean everything you said about like you know like the progression from like gods to mm -hmm. governments yeah you know and there's like a bit of an awakening maybe happening and, and maybe yeah. people start, start to realize that um that they are god <laughs> yeah exactly i mean this is this seems like pretty miraculous to me right we're like <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, we're on other side, either sides of like one of the biggest, you know, countries in the world. And yeah, we're like talking. I mean, come on. It's like, I mean, my, my Citadel will not honor deities. I'll say, do you, do you, do you prescribe, have you ever heard of a guy named Raymond Kurzweil? Yes. Oh yeah. 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 The, uh, the singularity is near. So what are your thoughts on that? I love it. And, and this is another thing that, okay, this I'm super stoked. We're going down this road because this is another thing about Bitcoiners. In fact, this should have been my point. It's just, I haven't talked about it with anybody. Um, Bitcoiners are not big on the idea, or at least the ones I've talked to, on the idea of like life extension and like um, changing the trajectory, the natural trajectory of, of extending somebody's life or living forever. I'm huge on that. If I could live forever, are you kidding me? Absolutely. And when I look deeper into that, when I see, so by the way, Ray Kurzweil, he, it, those that don't know, um, he's big on the idea that eventually technology will get to a point where we can extend human life faster than it degrades. So you get to a point where uh, medical technology is so quickly uh, developing so quickly for every year of human life, you get to the point where you can extend human life a year and a day. And once you get to that point, there is no end to human life unless it's like a devastating accident. And so um, he just wants to get to the point where he can out, he, he gets to that point where we're just, okay, we, you know, for every year I live, I can feasibly extend my life a year and like a minute. That's all I, I need, just need to live to that point where our medical technology is that far. And he's also big on the idea of the, the combination of, of humans and technology so that we kind of become one and, and technology gets to the point where it progresses so fast that you have trouble keeping up until maybe you become one with technology. Um, we see some of this with like Elon Musk's, well, I can't remember what it's called, like the neural implant, uh, which I, Neuralink? again, <laughs> Neuralink? Neuralink, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah Neuralink. And so, yeah, I, I get this, the fears of like a Skynet scenario with something like that. Um, you got to be careful about that. But I also uh, would probably want one of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> have and you driven a Tesla? Speaking of Elon Musk. I haven't. I have not. I, do, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get in one yet because I'm going to want one. Um, and then I'm, that's going to be, have you been in one? Have you been in one? No, no, you have it. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I try one. I, oh, sorry. I sat in one. I sat in like the SUV, uh, just like at, at a mall just to see what it was like inside, but I haven't been in a, mm. at one that's driving. I haven't felt the like <laughs> that I haven't felt that yet. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy what these guys are up to. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, okay. Man, this is actually a really fascinating conversation. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by that whole concept as well, you know, yeah. of, of the singularity 
and um, and essentially, you know, uh, some thing right that we give birth to in some way in the silicone silico form uh becomes where like the number of computations per second you know for a thousand dollars or whatever <laughs> degrades to a point where anybody can have a computer on their desk that's like smarter than all of humanity right that yeah like that's kind of the end game and and the thought is that once that happens things are gonna things are gonna change either for the better or for the worse people like elon musk actually are, they say this is the number one biggest threat that humanity faces today, not nuclear warfare, but yeah. like the emergence and like potentially, you know, this, well, that's, uh, why, anyway, that's, so that's why he's building open AI, right? He said it's, it's better to have it open source and everybody have access to it. Yeah, like, he stepped. Quick. Okay, first of all, open AI is insane. Have you tried like anything to GPT three? All this, yeah, like, yeah. Shit? Where you like or, build. seen the YouTube videos? Oh, yeah, I've I've crazy. tried talking to it a few times, and, or like like generating some stuff. I'm like, you wrote this from nothing. You know, okay. do you know this Marzon guy? I forget, I gotta get his name right. I keep referencing him, but the, I think his name. He's like a OG Bitcoin guy. Um, he wrote this. He wrote this blog. Uh that where he ran this experiment you got to read this blog but he, he he talks about how he ran this experiment where he let uh open ai free on the bitcoin talk forum <laughs> and how he ran all these like tests and and he was like monitoring like you know like like how many and it was actually doing really well and this was these were the learnings and then at the end of this entire listen to this at the end of this entire blog it's like dot, 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 and then goes, and then Marzen goes, okay, this entire blog was not written by me. <laughs> I never ran a test on Bitcoin talk. I literally just fed it these four lines of like, this is what I do. This is the university I'm at. This is the company I run. Here's a link to my blog. And essentially figured out the rest and came up with this elaborate plan to write a blog about him or open AI writing. <laughs> I, I could not wow. like that night. I was just like, no, I'm like, really? Did that just happen? Okay. Um, so, but just on a couple of things. So Elon Musk did step off, by the way, I think of the OpenAI project. He's no longer affiliated. More recently, mm -hmm. I think the actual code, um, which they deemed to be not safe to even release to the public, I think Microsoft like kind of like acquired it or something, right? So it is in some ways leading to a kind of draconian future, right? Where like this behemoth <laughs> yeah. of a company owns like Skynet, as you said. Um, so that brings me back to Bitcoin. I, I have this like weird, crazy idea that maybe something like Bitcoin or Bitcoin could be used as a tool to keep tabs on AI. Um, if you look at like some of the biggest threats that AI poses, some, one of it is like the fact that it just thinks so damn fast that we can't keep up with it. And if it thinks so fast and we have no way of like reliably recording its thought process, we don't even as humanity have a way of figuring out what the hell just happened. Um, and then if you think about like checks and balances, like what if all of us were like nodes and we could somehow, like I said, turn this thing off if we deemed like it was, you know, getting out of control. Like it shouldn't be in the hands of two governments and like three companies. Um, yeah. It seems like more right that it would be in the hands of everyone. So anyway, so, you know, we went from what religion to like Bitcoin to like AI and singularities kind of all over the place, but, but I guess bring us home. Um, so my, my final, one of my final questions, oh, by the way, we can keep going as long as you want, but one of my like big questions that I want to ask you, and this kind of, this conversation lends itself to it, which is, the same question I asked you about Bitcoin. So what do you believe to be true? And I said that most Bitcoiners would disagree with you on. So now the final question is what would like the world disagree with you on? And and I don't know, maybe Singularity is one of those because I don't think people would believe you on that. <laughs> but anything yeah. else? Um, it's funny because if I try to think of something that most of the most normies would disagree with me on, I'm like, oh, but a bunch of Bitcoiners would agree with that. <laughs> so, so I think that, um, again, I, I'm very, I think in general for, for like the, the day-to-day -day people that would disagree with me most, I've fallen into the idea that I don't think we should regulate much of anything. Uh, I think that if, if there's regulation, it should be down to like local governance. Um, because it's too difficult to try and 
put together all those cogs and moving pieces, even when it comes to like a country, um, it should be so hands off uh, that it, it should be again down to um, localized, you know, communities or or small cities, things like that, because then you can't get you can't understand all of the nuance um, of what's happening in an individual uh, in, in a country on an individual level. And that leads to bad regulation. So I, I think the abolishment of most regulations that we have today is a good thing. A lot of Bitcoiners would agree with that. On, on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, I think that that will come. I think eventually we'll see the loss of power of nation states and, and that gradually be diminished, just like it happened with the church. Um, and I think over time, you'll be more dependent on, uh, again, like consensus rules established by software that are just set out from the start, like Bitcoin, where you have a base. And if you want to partake in that system, you just follow the rules of that base. Um, I think you'll see the same with, with how people live in general. So this is kind of like the Bitcoin Citadel idea where it's very local governance oriented and you choose your locale based on the values of that individual place. Right now, if you live in a, in a, a certain place, a certain country, a certain city, you're kind of at the whim of whatever the voter base um, says at that time. Um, and so you could live somewhere and have moved there for certain reasons, but then other people, uh, maybe, maybe there's an influx of, of people from other parts of the country or whatever that have different ideas and that voter base gradually changes that trajectory. So a good, a good parallel right now is a ton of people are leaving California because of their regulatory environment for businesses and they're heading to a lot of them to Texas. Texans are super worried that Texas is going to be, is going to get a big dose of Californication <laughs> and that the, the voter base will then reflect upon, uh, you know, those, these new voters coming in will then be able to kind of, you know, change regulation to reflect what California has. And they're very worried about that. And so I, I think a better idea is establishing places that have certain values and then choosing what your values are and then going to those locations um, freely, freely. I think, I think people should have a choice of what they value and where they go. And, and that's fine. Um, much like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies offer, what are your values? What do you want to do? Okay, go do that. I just happen to think that Bitcoin is what has the value in the long term for preserving, uh, preserving my, my labor, the fruits of my labor. And so I only have Bitcoin. And so I think you'll see that play out and the most, the, the most promising and best ways of doing things will allow those places to prosper. So Again, kind of kind of a mixed bag because some of it Bitcoiners would be like, yeah, absolutely, and others not. Um, and then on <laughs> just just to stick one more to uh, the anti antithesis to a lot of what Bitcoiners think, uh, my strategy right now to go down that Ray Kurzweil path is to stack Sats, hope that they are, you know, hope that I'm correct in the value of those Sats over time. Uh, to potentially live long enough to afford the or early iterations of the singularity achieving uh, integration of man and machine. <laughs> sounds, sounds glorious to me. Most people would disagree with us though. You know, even my wife, she's like, I don't want to live forever. Like that just sounds wrong. And this and that I'm like, no, really? I'm no. Like, could it's you imagine yourself being like a hundred years old or a hundred and whatever? And you're just like, breaking apart, nothing works. It must be painful. And it's like the biggest tragedy of mankind that we settle with this disease called old age. Like we should uh, get, be yeah. rid of that. Like, yeah, I, I think this is perfectly, agree. but this is perfectly for me, it's perfectly in line with, um, like I've been talking about this whole time, the ethos of, of low time preference. Cause right now, a lot of Bitcoiners say like, okay, what are your actions today? What fruits of your labor will come about 
um, by postponing uh, gratification until later. And so, you know, you, you build wealth now for your family down the road. And so you have a legacy or whatever. Um, imagine the low time preference actions that would be afforded with an extended life of hundreds of years or infinite years where you now can go out and, and see the stars. All of a sudden, people like Elon Musk that are, are looking towards Mars are now planning trajectories of exiting the solar system and going to neighboring solar systems and neighboring galaxies eventually and being able to see the fruits of their labor centuries down the road right where where you actually your actions now and over the coming decades and centuries could lead to the creation of of new settlements in the stars and you could see that happen think of the low time preference opportunities that would be afforded It'd be your tesla that takes you there yeah exactly <laughs> i'll be the new moon man <laughs> no uh no i i i i agree you know actually more recently i've been I've been trying to think like long and hard about why I really love Bitcoin. And I've come to this like conclusion that our arch nemesis is time uh, for all of us. Like whether it's like, you know, singularity trying to escape death, whether it's us thinking about what happened, you know, last week or last year and someone said something or whether it's us thinking about what's going to happen in some future time period it's always like time, like um, that we're always worried about. And even with money, right? Like when I was just locked into fiat world, time, there was always more month than there was money. You know, you could never like get ahead. But Bitcoin, again, because of its deflationary nature, right? Uh, one of the big things that I think people miss is, is that it reverses the hands of time. And you're able to now for every hour of saving that you put away, that hour can turn into like five or 10 or more. And you're not like constantly trying to fight against it. It's like, it's this beautiful, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, even, even, even the idea of just being able to preserve an hour of your time across time mm. is, is groundbreaking, for, at least for us, for our generation, because we've never had that. We've never mm -hmm. been able to work an hour, earn a set number of units of monetary value and have that hour of labor be equal a decade later. Mm -hmm. That's, it's unheard of. So just the fact that you have that plus potential upside, I think I think a lot of upside eventually less because, you know, it'll, <laughs> I think we'll get to the point where Bitcoin is just mildly deflationary if it succeeds. But I, <laughs> but like, it's, it's just, it, it informs, I, I don't know about you, but it informs your decision so much better when you say, okay, I've put this much time, effort, and, and created this much value. And what am I going to do with that value? You, you mm -hmm. start questioning your purchases more. You start being more thoughtful about where you put your money. You start and, actually and, saving. And every single time I've sold Bitcoin, and I have sold Bitcoin, right? Um, I, I think I bought my first Bitcoin at $14, but I didn't hold that $14 worth of Bitcoin. I wish I had, but you know, life came up, right? Like there were times where you just needed to liquidate and whatnot. But I'll tell you one thing, every single time I liquidated, I went on to regret it. And now I'm at a point where like, I will do anything I can to not sell Bitcoin. You know, it's like, if I'm selling Bitcoin, then there's, you know, we need it. <laughs> um, yeah. But, 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 and I try and think, and I'm trying to get more into this like mindset of like building wealth like intergenerationally, right? Like where mm -hmm. I don't even touch it. Like, even if I don't get the singularity, it's like not mine to touch. Like it's, it's something bigger. And it's like, it's almost like buying a piece of freedom for like me and the people I bring into the earth and those around me. And it's just like, oh man, it smells great. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, um, okay. So how are we doing for time, by the way? How are you doing for time? Uh, yeah, I think it's like, um, let me just do a quick time check on my side. So we, I think we can go another five or 10 minutes. Do you yep. want to, uh, maybe before I, I wrap up and ask you some final questions and whatnot, did you have any questions for me on anything or do you want to maybe set up another time where we could do yeah. something like that? Yeah. I, you know what? 
Like, come on my show. Let's go, let's, let's do, do a, that. Let's, let's yeah, do that. Let's I do think I'd like that. Yeah. I think there's a lot to cover there too, but I'd love to do that. Um, do you want to maybe share with at least, you know, the people that are in my sphere uh, about like where they can learn more about you, you know, BTC sessions, but like you want to give them the actual domains and the Twitter handles yeah. and yeah. Yeah. So pretty much YouTube, just BTC sessions. You can okay. find me there. Uh, Twitter handle is the same, just at BTC sessions, all one word. Um, and then I do have a website as well. Uh, which is btcsessions.ca. Um, Love it. Represent. Yeah, that's, that, those are pretty much the main places to find me. That's where I'm most active. Beautiful. And then in any parting comments, anything else you want to share? I don't know, anything that's top of mind, uh, any warnings you want to give people about some scams or I don't know, something inspirational? Uh, what do you want to leave again, us with? Again, like I, I, I always stress this to anybody that's that's anywhere near the beginning of their journey about learning about this stuff mm -hmm. is is try to try to learn and understand bitcoin as much as possible before you entertain the idea of anything else um because if you understand the roots of why everything that has happened was created in the first place and what it was seeking to actually achieve and what it was seeking to fix if you understand how it's aiming to achieve that, then you can actually take that and hold it up and use that as a litmus test for everything else. And now it, I've kind of fine tuned that process for myself where somebody can come to me and say like, Hey, I, I love this. You should check it out. And I, I've got my list of like six things and I look at it and I just go start going down the list. And if it doesn't tick something, I'm like, like, oh, I'm not going to put my time it, time, like you were saying, is, is like the most scarce asset that we have outside of Bitcoin. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm not going to funnel my time into something that doesn't serve what I'm trying to achieve. Cool, man. Well, super. Uh, yeah, I feel I feel like we're connected, you know, more than this, yeah. the, the province thing. Uh, this BTC <laughs> thing has us speaking the same language. So, Thanks again. You know, we, we kind of jammed yeah. for a bit there. I would love to do it again soon whenever you're down. And yeah, uh, yeah let's yeah. just call it, I guess. 100%. Come on the show. Be happy to have you. All right. Take care.